Okay, and we're going to go ahead. Um, so I hope you guys have, I heard a, a few, I jumped into a few different breakout sessions. And in general, you know what we heard, what we heard was uh, from the majority of people I heard was, you know, it's, it's built this, this lack of empathy. I heard that in a few different rooms, you know, how do you, how do you build empathy? How do you hone the skill of empathy? And that's kind of what we're wanting to talk about is how, and we're gonna address that a little later on today. So everyone, I apologize. I'm sorry, everyone here in the room, Mitch, Mitch. I'm sorry, I really apologize. I really need to get us back in line here. I apologize. Y'all can continue the conversation at lunchtime. Sorry, now this is part of my recording. Okay, sorry. This never happens to anyone in class, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I'm, I'm usually I'm usually super friendly about it, but uh, we have someone who's coming who's going to talk to us right now. Uh, if you're more than welcome to stay, uh, and we will have some other discussions during lunchtime. And feel free to take up that time to actually go through and have your discussions during lunch, uh, if you'd like to. Because I want you to continue the conversations. Because what's really important is that we build a community here. It's more important than just what we're talking about. It's also because you know if you can if you I've seen the chats. And a lot of you are having some really amazing discussions and it's really important that we build a resource community here. All of you have been to your PLCs where you're going, uh, you know, I hope that's not what you feel here. I hope that you actually feel that you've got a lot of support and a lot of individuals around you who will, uh, who have a lot of knowledge. And that's really important as well. There are a lot of people online uh, who have taught Holocaust studies. We have a lot of educators who have been to a lot of different, who have been to many different symposiums. We have a lot of uh, uh, our speakers who uh, will remain engaged with us and really act as that support for each and every one of you. And with that, uh, we're gonna take just 30 seconds here and I'm gonna introduce uh, Ms. Fanny Cernick and she's gonna help you here and sit with us. And I'm gonna share our screen with you uh, and we're gonna uh, you know, have her read the terrible things. And uh, go ahead in line, it, online if you'd like to. Has anyone in here heard of the book, The Terrible Things? Okay. And I, one I knew, one I expected, actually two I expected. And uh, so when you talk about building empathy, and we talk about SEL, uh, you know, I, and uh, think about this. And then one of the first questions was, you know, I asked, how do you, how did you feel after that tour? And I asked that for a reason is, you know, do you ever ask your students, how do you feel? How are you feeling today? I mean, and really mean it, not as a not as a gesture, not as a checkbox, because you know, it's like really, how do you feel? Because that will really determine how engaged they're going to be and how they're going to connect with you. And no matter how busy you are, I don't know about many of you, but one of my first experiences uh, that I had with a school teacher with my own daughter before I started teaching was I, I asked about some issues she was having in class, and the teacher responded and said to me. How am I expected to know how your daughter's doing? I have 140 kids to deal with. Who's your kid again? And um, she was seven, by the way, when I had this discussion. And that's when I took it as uh, that's when I took it as my challenge to go. Okay, let's see if I can do this. And and I started teaching. Uh, that was after, of course, you know, leaving another career. But imagine, you know, my daughter came had a fairly fairly what I call, you know, stable and consistent background. How many students do you have that, that have a challenging background, have a life at home that's difficult? You know, I mean, honestly, and that they're, and all of us do, you know, they are struggling. I've had students who are saying, I'm not connecting right now because I'm thinking about how I got to go to work tonight so I can put food on my family's table because I'm the one who has to go work. I'm not skipping my class to, today, this afternoon, for any other reason other than the fact that I, I, I have to go to work early because my mother can't work today. Uh, you know, so we have to consider all of these things and all many of you already know this and it's again a matter of time, but it's deliberately stopping, taking a pause, showing them and I, I honestly don't think that I would have an issue with any educators that are on this call or any of the educators that are in this room because the fact that you're here speaks volumes uh, to your character as educators and not that everyone is not amazing and everyone is, but some people use that you, you've all met someone in your school who is very much, I don't care, this is a waste, this kid is a, you know, a waste of time. Um, how can you build empathy with students if that is your mindset? Uh, you know, how can you build that connection? And again, 
it's a skill. And sometimes it's that, it's that one moment. That's why we do this. It's that one moment that you have with your students. That's the why I do it. And I can, you've all had more than the one moment, right? The that one where that student is like reaching back out to you and they're talking to you about like, hey, guess what? Thanks for not giving up on me. This is, you know, this is cool. I have one student who everyone said was going to fail out and wasn't going to make it. It's now getting their law degree and uh, as wants to be a public defender and wants to help out underprivileged uh, youth. I have another one who uh, was skipping regularly and uh, was told would never amount to anything is now getting their degree in sociology and wants to go into a uh, social worker, uh, wants to go and be a social worker. It's challenging, these are challenging jobs. Um, but when you hear this, you know, and, and they go back and they go, I still think of my lessons from your Holocaust class. They don't say, I think about the dead bodies. I don't think about the imagery you showed me that like scarred me and tore me up. Uh, they didn't give me my list of my vocab words that I gave them on uh, on Gemeinschaft or my all the dates they gave me. They gave me the personal connection because at the time when they were in my class, they got D's. They didn't do well. They these were not students who were like star as star pupils as far as test taking goes. And guess what? That doesn't matter. The fact they didn't get great grades in my class didn't mean that that we didn't build a connection that had them want to get to that next level. You know, that wanted to have them connect and learn more. It didn't mean I had a uh, wonderful psych teacher who told my, my daughter said, you've done so much to inspire me in this class. Let me use her as an example again. You've done so much to inspire me in this class. And uh, I want to be a psychiatrist. This was his response. This was a friend of mine, by the way. Well, you really probably should, your grades aren't good enough to do that. You should probably think of something else. So I had to go back in and go, well, let's just see where you are right now. Uh, so as far as being an actual, I said, because is your, do you have a degree, do you have a degree in psychology or anything for that matter? I said, and I said, and to be able to make that determination, I said, on a child and what you've done now, I said, it's just, you've just labeled her and put her in a corner because of her grades in your AP psych class, which I've been told is nothing more than a lot of vocab memorization. You know, and, and that for the time it was, there was no practical applied psychology being used. In. Was, is that a helpful tone to take with students? You know, I mean, and, and we, have, we all have our different opinions, but what can we do to engage them? And with it using this history, uh, you know, how we want, if you want to build empathy, it, it requires a skill. And so I'd like to, you know, start with, uh, you know, this, you know, those of you who are teaching in elementary school, you may have seen this, uh, this uh, book. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen. I've got to uh, join the session here and I'm gonna share my screen that, so, you get, so you all can see it. And, uh, and we're gonna, and since I'm in the same tour, It's funny if you'd like to come up here. Um, so I had the privilege this year of working with, this is Ms. Fanny Cernick. Fanny teaches next door at the Jewish Academy. Um, Fanny is just an amazing educator. Uh, and now I say an amazing, amazing educator. I mean, Fanny, uh, Fanny students at fifth by fifth grade know more than most of my high school students and have uh, have done more projects regarding the Holocaust than many of the students that I have. Could you make me a co-host in the joint? And uh, yeah, because I yeah I need to make a co-host for here for the one I just I just joined. Um, and her students came here for Yom HaShoah, uh, which is uh, Israeli Holocaust Remembrance. It was just recently. And uh, they passed around a Czech Holocaust Torah. And, um, and but I remember last year we had a session on resistance. And I said, what does resistance look like? And she had a younger student, younger, the smaller girl who looked up and she raised her hand and she said, laughter in the ghetto. You know, and think about that. You know, having that type of insight in, you know, fourth or fifth grade, where does that go? Um, you know, where does that go? We, uh, so I think it's really important that these are skills. This is something you, you teach. This is part of what you do. Uh, let me share my screen and share my Chrome tab. And I will click through this. So Fanny's going to read this. Um, oh, that's a good, that's 
Oh, no, that's the first page. And I'm going to, we'll go and uh, read this book. And Fanny, I'm going to have, I'm going to put this microphone down here. You don't have, no, I'm just going to have it right here. That way you don't have to have it on you. It's okay. Right. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. And I'll flip through the slide when you're ready. Okay. I'm just going to read for us. Uh, so story time, everyone gather around uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, listen to uh, Fanny read the story, Horrible Things. So thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I appreciate your words. Uh, there were two questions that you posted on the chat. Okay. How do you start teaching about the Holocaust? And if you have only one day, what would you do? And I told my uh, friends that I was talking to, this is how, what I would do. So I'm going to share this story with you. The clearing in the woods was home to the small forest creatures. The birds and squirrels shared the trees. The rabbits and porcupines shared the shade beneath the trees and the frogs and fish shared the cool brown waters of the forest pond. They were content until the day the terrible things came. Little Rabbit saw their terrible shadows before he saw them. They stopped at the edge of the clearing and their shadows blotted out, blotted out the sun. We have come for every creature with feathers on its back, the terrible things thunder. We don't have feathers, the frog said, nor we, said the squirrels, nor we, said the porcupines, nor we, said the rabbits. The little fish leaped from the water to show the shine of their scales, but the birds twittered nervously in the tops of the trees. Feathers, they rose in the air, then screamed away into the blue of the sky. But the terrible things had brought their terrible nets and they flung them high and caught the birds and carried them away. The other forest creatures talked nervously among themselves. Those birds were always too noisy, old porcupine said. Good riddance, I say. There's more room in the trees now, the squirrel said. Why did the terrible things want the birds, little rabbit asked. What's wrong with feathers? We mustn't ask, big, rab big rabbit said. The terrible things don't need a reason. Just be glad it wasn't as they want. Now there were no birds to sing in the clearing, but life went on almost as before until the day the terrible things came back. Little rabbit heard the thump of their terrible feet before they came into sight. We have come for every bushy tailed creature who lives in the clearing, the terrible things thunder. We have no tails, the frog said. Nor do we, not real tales, the porcupine said. The little fish leaped from the water to show the smooth shine of their thin tails, and the rabbits turned their rumps so the terrible things could see them for themselves. Our tails are round and flurry, they said. By no means are they bushy. The squirrels chittered their fear and ran high into the treetops, but the terrible things swung their, swung their terrible nets higher than the squirrels could run, and wider than the squirrels could leap, and they caught them all and carried them away. Those squirrels were greedy, Big Rabbit said, always storing away things for themselves, never sharing. But why did the terrible things take them away? Little Rabbit asked, do the terrible things want the clearing for themselves? No, they have their own place, Big Rabbit said, but the terrible things don't need a reason. Just mind your own business, Little Rabbit. We don't want them to get mad at us. Now there were no birds to sing or squirrels to chitter in the trees, but life in the clearing went on almost as before until the day the terrible things came again. Little rabbit heard the rumble of their terrible voices. We have come for every creature that swims the terrible things thunder. Oh, we can't swim, the rabbit said quickly, and we can't swim, the porcupine said. The frogs dive deep in the forest pool and ripples spiraled like corkscrews in the dark brown water. The little fish darted this way and that in streaks of silver. But the terrible things threw their terrible nets down into the depths and they dragged up the dripping frogs and the shimmering fish and carried them away. Why did the terrible things take them, little rabbit asked? What did the frogs and the fish do to them? Probably nothing, big rabbit said but the terrible things don't need a reason. Many creatures dislike frogs, lumpy, slimy things, and fish are so cold and unfriendly. They never talk to any of us. Now there were no birds to sing, no squirrels to chitter, no frogs to croak, no fish to play in the forest pool. 
A nervous silence filled the clearing, but life went on almost as usual until the day the terrible things came back. Little rabbits smelled their terrible smell before they came into sight. The rabbits and the porcupines looked everywhere except at each other. We have come for every creature that sprouts quills, the terrible king thunder. The rabbits stopped quivering. We don't have quills, they said, fluffing their soft white fur. The porcupines bristled with all their strength, but the terrible things covered them with the curl of their terrible nets and the porcupines hanging them like flies in a spider's web as the terrible things carried them away. Those porcupines always were bad tempered, big rabbit said shakily. Prickly, stickly things. This time, little rabbit didn't ask why. By now, he knew that the terrible things didn't need a reason. The smell still filled the clearing, though the terrible things had, the terrible things had gone. I liked it better when there were all kinds of creatures in our clearing, he said. And I think we should move. What if the terrible things come back? Nonsense, big rabbit said. Why would, should we move? This has always been our home and the terrible things won't come back. We are the white rabbits. It couldn't happen to us. As they follow peaceful day, little rabbit thought big rabbit must be right until the day the terrible things came back. Little rabbit saw the terrible gleam of their terrible eyes through the forest darkness and he smelled again the terrible smell. We have come for any creature that is white, the terrible things thunder. There are no white creatures here but us, the rabbit said. We have come for you, the terrible thing said. The rabbit scampered in every direction. Help, they screamed, somebody help. But there was no one left to help. And the big circling nets dropped over them and the terrible things carried them away. All but little rabbit, who was little enough to hide in a pile of rocks by the pond and smart enough to stay so still that the terrible things thought he, thought he was a rock himself. They had all gone, little rabbit crept into the middle of the empty clearing, the empty clearing. I should have tried to help the other rabbits, he thought. If only we creatures had stuck together, it could have been different. Sadly, little rabbit left the clearing. He'd go tell other forest creatures about the terrible things. Oh he hoped someone would listen. So, comments, questions, thoughts? Yes. I think that's a wonderful way to introduce the ideas of the program about what actually happened and why it's important to speak up and stay together. Somebody made a connection online. Does anybody here uh, know what this also? There's another poem this is very much connected to. The hangman. Martin Z. Miller poem. Oh, that's the quote. His yeah, quote. Yeah, uh, yeah. And Michael said on Tuesday that the worst crime was silence. Mm -hmm. This teaches us that we have to speak up. And is this one of the first things you do? That's the first thing I do. I teach fourth and fifth graders the Holocaust and in fourth grade, though they have been here for Yoma Shoah, Steven said, this is the first thing that I do with them. Uh, they know we're going to, to talk about the Holocaust, but I don't tell them this is about the Holocaust. I just listen and then we'll talk about the story. And I hear everything they have to say, uh, whatever crosses their mind. And then from then we move on. In fourth grade. So that, if you imagine if you remove the part in the beginning where you do not say if this is an allegory to the Holocaust, whether you whether they understand the term allegory yet or not, you know they. Uh, but Ruth. I used, I actually used it um, with my seventh graders when I taught seventh grade and with my tenth graders when I um, when I taught in high school and did the same way. I didn't tell them that it, it had anything to do with the Holocaust, and it it is a great starter. It's kind of like a a soft entry into Correct. the talk. Correct. I mean, prepares them for, for anything. So, yeah, that is. So, does anyone else uh, see this? See an example of what that now? I'll also, I've posted some questions. Uh, there, is an, there is a lesson. Let's see if I've got this. That should be for terrible things within the session that you can see. But, you know, what are some things you could do? Uh, is this only appropriate for introducing younger kids to the Holocaust? Go ahead. Well, my process was different. I didn't say that we used it to diminish the extent 
what happened in Europe as Hitler's progressing through the different countries. Um, and we talked about how it's important to be an upstander, not a bystander. And so that's the point that we did in that dialogue. All right. Uh, I posted this in Whova for those of you who are looking and seeing this on uh, online. But just here some questions, and there are two parts to this lesson. Uh, and this is actually, uh, and uh, and this is kind of some of the way that Fanny introduced it. There's uh, doing this over two days, and this lesson is actually listed as being uh, for middle and high school, not for elementary schools. And it actually starts off in general by having students create uh, advice and handling the terrible things. Uh, it's got some procedures and strategies, but I'm going to go over the question, you know, how did the animals in the woods get along before the things came? Uh, how are the terrible things described? What verbs are used to describe their actions? Uh, looking at the illustrations, what do you think, why do you think they're in black and white? Uh, and this, could, I, I think there's a way to introduce this even into your history classes, because if you go to the next session, and we actually, the next section in this evaluation, Students evaluated on, you know, their advice and they, they're going to create images and posters. But in the next section, you will actually talk about genocide, about the Holocaust itself. And then, you know, of course, introduce the terms of uh, the literary term allegory, uh, compare the terrible things to the Holocaust, and then evaluate their advice from day one, where they had not been introduced that this is an allegory to the Holocaust. And now let's just dis discuss what an allegory is and why would this be impactful? And speaking to, I had some people online who posted, who, who uh, immediately recognized this as something like, you know, uh, Niemöller's poem. And part of this is actually, uh, in this was actually copies of the poem, First They Came for the Jews, uh, and this uh, as a statement, and then the poem being handed out and then having the students make comparisons to the poem and to the story here and discussing. And I want to say also this year, the topic of the high school contest, the Red Lotus was responses to the Holocaust. I, I do the same thing with art. My kids do a project in art and they use this also. They refer back to this as, but they, that's a response to the Holocaust. I yeah. think that and this is really good, but so we, they use that too. We have the, so we, we uh, every year we've, we've done a, a writing con essay contest or have the past two years, it's a research-based contest, which Mitch wonderfully uh, volunteered to help judge and uh, and went through a, a lot uh, to go through we you know a, a number of essays and uh, but Fanny came to me last year and said well we've always done this art contest and can we still have my students participate in, a, in a, an art contest and so we uh, and the, the topic was responses to the Holocaust and this year one of her students who won uh, uh, if you like to tell us Emmy yeah. and this is this is a girl in fourth grade um, she had never heard about the Holocaust but her great grandmother was a nurse with one of the army um, group that groups that went to to the liberate the camps or after the camps so they went to Maidanic so she chose to use her great grandmother's story to for her project so when you looked at the project, it was up, we needed both of us to open it. It was many pieces of papers put together with some of them with pictures of her great grandmother at the time of the liberation of the camp and some others with kindness, support for LGBT, um, respect and things like that. And when you turn it, she had put dots, uh, yellow and blue, 11,500 dots, she counted. Uh, one for each two people that were found in the camp when her grandmother was that. And why those colors? Because they were the uh, Ukrainian flag to represent what was going on today between Russia and Ukraine. That's an amazing project. It was, it was about, uh, was it four feet by three feet? It was uh, in the shape of a flag and it was, each dot was like one of those little big marker dots. And when you opened it up, it looked like the Ukrainian flag and each dot represented two people who, and it was really, it was it was so simplistic and yet so amazing and so insightful for a student had who had no connection other than her, uh, her grandmother to the Holocaust. Uh, it wasn't something that she had known about, but really had built this connection, and it was it was really uh, really impressive. So you know, again, many of you are high school teachers, but uh, you know, I really think a lot of these skills are taught and early on, and especially elementary school age students as they progress through. And even, in, you know, there's opportunities in middle and high school to really foster that and make connections. And Fanny, thank you so much for sharing and for thank reading. For this. You're the best. She's so wonderful. Oh, thank you for Appreciate inviting. her so much. Um, this lesson is actually posted. 
uh, for you to be able to use how you will or modify. Uh, and again, there's different, there's different variations. There's no right or wrong way to use this lesson inside your class. Uh, um, but I think it's a great way at any age to introduce and discuss the Holocaust. Um, and, and especially, you know, for those of you who are online, we have uh, some uh, ELL uh, uh, educators. We have students, teachers who are in uh, intensive reading classes. Uh, this is a great way to get students to start reading and uh, before you go into other other uh, topics of the Holocaust to just introduce them. Um, I don't know if Jersey's still on, but I really appreciate all the time that he took with us today. I appreciate the time that Fanny took with us today uh, for the for the tour, and I hope that everyone was able to get the business up. This is a heavy morning. It was a, it was a lot. It was it was a lot. Um, for those of you, I just want to say. Ruth, who's going to be interviewing our Holocaust survivor uh, here, is, uh, who's coming in, uh, and uh, at, she'll be in at one o'clock. Uh, and her name is Suzanne Schneider. This is a probably uh, this is a lot for Ruth too, because Ruth's father survived Auschwitz, um, and uh, she sometimes comes here to the center and tells her father's story. Um, and it, it's it's you know very powerful, um, and I think it'll be a, a really amazing session. So I hope everyone's going to uh, jump back in uh, at one o'clock to hear Suzanne. I want everyone to enjoy your lunch. Hopefully, take time to talk, discuss, and to come back. And when I I, I, I won't yell anybody, so I'll just hold my hand up and hopefully wave people down. But just so we can all start with him. Yeah, so I do that. Do I do bubble in the mouth though? That first, yeah, that. But thank you all so much, uh, and I hope you all have a good lunch. Thank you all online. I appreciate you all for joining us. Jersey, you're still out on us at all? Can you stop the recording? Yeah. 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 Yeah.